Our scripture lesson from Romans is Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Well, the Easter season has come and gone. Last week, we celebrated Pentecost. Next Sunday begins the months-long period known as Ordinary Time, which simply means the weeks are numbered in order, but which sounds like it means don't expect any love feasts for a while. <laughs> but between Pentecost and the counting through of Ordinary Time comes this unusual day, Trinity Sunday. Now we're told that Trinity Sunday is the only day set aside in the church year to celebrate not an event, but a doctrine. Well, that certainly sounds exciting. But in the early centuries of the church, it was exciting. A seat at the table where doctrine was created was the hot ticket, and the arguments around that table were even hotter. It took more than 300 years, nearly 400, before a council of bishops nailed down the doctrine of the Trinity as expressed in the Nicene Creed. That creed describes the mysterious relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit as an ongoing process. Jesus the Son is eternally begotten of the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father if you are in the Western tradition as we are. An argument over whether the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father or from the Father and the Son was the cause of the first great schism of the church in 1054. So we could look at the Trinity as a bone of contention, a complicated theological argument that makes us relieved not to have been sitting at that table where doctrine was created. But how else might we look at the Trinity on this Trinity Sunday? We could look at it as the Eastern Church does, as a mystery that inspires us to contemplation. Perhaps through that contemplation, we could experience some deeper vision of the nature of God. But to draw deep sustenance from the doctrine of the Trinity, we can actually turn to the words of the Apostle Paul who never uses the word Trinity, and who wrote more than 250 years before the Council of Nicaea hammered out its first version of the creed, but who nevertheless writes powerfully of an ongoing relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and who locates our encounter with that triune God at the heart of our suffering. Even in so short a text as the one assigned for today, Paul names all three persons of the Trinity and points out relationships among them. He writes, Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Now, frankly, I think this text can sometimes be a little dangerous in the hands of us privileged Americans. 
I think that we as a nation are sometimes tempted to see our privilege as proof that we are on God's good side. And moreover, that we somehow got there by our own hard work and virtue. Now that really would be something to boast about, wouldn't it? Especially when the next part of this passage seems to play right into our American rags to riches narrative. The narrative that says through hardship I made something of myself. We know how this works, right? Suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. At a surface level, it sounds like your dad insisting that when he was a boy, he walked to school barefoot in the snow, uphill both ways, and son, that built character. <laughs> the word translated here as character can also be translated as something like testedness. The New Interpreter's Bible says we describe such testedness when we say someone is firm as a rock. To be so strong, so firm, that sounds like something that would be applauded in our culture. And it was in Paul's culture too, where the philosophy of Stoicism encouraged its followers to develop fortitude in the face of suffering. But is fortitude sufficient? If everyone's ideal is to become firm as a rock, that's going to leave us in a very cold and stony world. Is fortitude all we can expect to build on the foundation of our suffering? Well, actually what Paul describes here with suffering producing endurance and endurance producing character is not something we can build at all. It's not something we control. It's not something we achieve by hard work and virtue. It's not a process of construction. Construction would be a controlled application of external forces where you build something block by block. But the verb in Paul's passage is not builds or constructs. The verb is usually translated as produces. Paul seems to be describing not a mechanical, controlled, and external process like construction, but something organic, caused by natural forces, internal forces, like birth. How would it change this sequence of events if you pictured suffering giving birth to endurance. Picture suffering all but turning itself inside out, pushing out in one explosive movement a new form, bearing the image of the first but transformed into something new. Now imagine that this new form surrounds its source like a ring of fire surrounding the sun, an emanation. In this picture, suffering is surrounded by the endurance which it has produced. And this new form, this new emanation, in turn produces another ring of fire, testedness. Now testedness surrounds endurance, which surrounds suffering. And here is the crucial point. The process does not stop with testedness. This point is what definitively separates Paul's vision from Stoicism or any other human attempt to construct a system for dealing with suffering. Suffering gives birth to endurance. Endurance gives birth to testedness. And testedness, finally, gives birth to hope. If suffering produced only endurance, or if endurance produced only testedness, then suffering might indeed leave us firm as rocks, but it would also leave us sitting firmly rock-like in what we know. Whereas hope, as Paul tells us later in Romans, moves us beyond what we know. In Romans 8.24 he writes, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? Hope allows for possibilities beyond what we know. Theologian Jürgen Moltmann says that hope alone takes seriously 
the possibilities with which all reality is fraught. Unimaginable possibilities exist within the unimaginable grace of God, within which, Paul tells us, we now stand because of Christ's death, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. In Paul's day and in Paul's language, boasting had no negative connotation as you and I understand it. Paul was not encouraging Christians to brag about their hope. The verb he uses might be better translated as celebrate. We celebrate our hope of sharing in the glory of God because hope surrounds our testedness, and testedness surrounds our endurance, and endurance surrounds our suffering. So ultimately, hope surrounds our suffering. And at the heart of our suffering is the cry that connects us to God. Two weeks ago, I had the great privilege of meeting with some of our confirmands to discuss their beliefs. They laid out those beliefs in an essay that they wrote as their long months of study came to an end. Aida Bell has given me permission to share with you a sentence from her essay. She wrote, I believe that suffering is a way to see God because when you are suffering, you ask for help from God. I think Aida sees what Paul sees, that within the heart of our suffering is the desire to know God. And that desire for God seems to me the energy that fuels and sustains the process that surrounds our suffering with hope. We receive that desire from the Holy Spirit. As Martin Luther writes in his small catechism, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Ghost has called me by the gospel enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. And as Paul writes in our text today, the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Now that translation where I said the love of God, that differs from the New Revised Standard, but it's a literal translation and I use it on good authority. The NRSV translates it, God's love, but the Greek says, the love of God, and there is room to interpret it either as God's love toward us or as our love toward God. It makes sense that what the Holy Spirit places in our hearts is not God's love for us, but our longing for God, our desire for God, our love for God. As the Holy Spirit inspires us to reach for God, Christ provides access to God. And so we stand within God's grace in hope of sharing God's glory. Each person of the Trinity connects us to the other persons in a relationship that is an eternal procession, an eternal begetting, eternally surrounding us as hope surrounds our suffering. When I think of hope that surrounds our suffering, I think of a man I know named Ashley Sire, who has also given me permission to share his words with you today. I met Ashley in Divinity School at Wake Forest. Today he's training as I did as a chaplain at Baptist Hospital. But before he began Divinity School, he was a hospital patient diagnosed with leukemia. And here is what he wrote about a night during his chemotherapy. I was alone in my hospital room on the cancer floor. It was dark and silent. I was out of bed and walking around. The enormity of what I was facing and the side effects of treatment washed over me that night and I was overwhelmed with grief. I tried to pray to God, but nothing came out. I guess I had so many burdens that they bottlenecked in my soul. I finally managed to talk to God, but what came out was a sigh. Not a sigh of relief or frustration, but a deep guttural sound that came from the very bottom of my being. 
and contained each and every fear, worry, and dread that I was carrying. It was in that moment that I felt God's presence in the room with me. I knew that everything would be all right. I might not leave the floor, but things would be all right. In that time of suffering, how could things be all right? Ashley did not need to know how. What mattered at that moment was that his suffering was surrounded by the endurance it had produced. And the endurance was surrounded by the testedness it had produced. And testedness was surrounded by the hope it had produced. And because he was surrounded by hope, Ashley was standing in the presence of God. God was not standing in Ashley's presence. Ashley, surrounded by hope, was standing in the, in the presence of God, and the possibilities were endless. Paul had a lot to say about suffering. It's one of his favorite and most compelling topics. You can learn a lot by reading Paul's many words on suffering. But for my money, the Bible's best book about suffering is the worthy story of Job. During my training in chaplaincy, we talked almost daily about suffering, and Job came up again and again. And one of my colleagues drew on Job for a picture of the Trinity that I will never forget. She saw the Trinity present with us as Job's three friends are present with him in chapter 2, verse 13. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. After a year as witness to so much suffering in the hospital, this chaplain pictured Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three friends sitting around us in the dust, saying nothing, but surrounding us in our suffering. At the heart of suffering, our desire for God connects us with an eternal process of birth. From suffering is born endurance. From endurance, testedness. From testedness, hope. It is an organic process, even a cosmic process. An ongoing procession. An eternal begetting. And hope eternally begotten, eternally surrounds our suffering souls. Amen. <laughs>